Dr. Fizz here. The Maxwell equations in differential form. We're going to take the integral form of the Maxwell equations and use our two important theorems that we just talked about, the divergence theorem and Stokes theorem, and show that we can transform these to a differential form. We start with the first one, Gauss's law, and the divergence theorem says that we can replace the surface integration that encloses a volume with an integration over that volume where the integrand is del dot e vector. Now this suggests that the right hand side should be integrated in some way with respect to a volume. I could do that and say well how could I think of this as some kind of integration? Well the charge is the result of integrating the charge density over a volume and that is the way we're going to go with this. The charge over epsilon sub naught is equal to the charge density integrated over the volume. That gets you the charge inside. That's perfect. And to do a clean mathematical argument you want to uh, subtract so that you have an integrand integrated over a volume equal to zero because then you could use this really important argument that comes up a lot in mathematical physics that since the volume uh, region is arbitrary and can be chosen at will that you can count on getting zero by some lucky choice of the volume element and the volume region that you're going to integrate over therefore it's the integrand that must vanish all the time to make this equation true all the time. That's the clean mathematical argument and that brings us to stating that the integrand is zero and the result del dot e vector is rho over epsilon sub naught. That's our first Maxwell equation in differential form. That's Gauss's law and that's Coulomb's law in an, still another form. If we look at the second law of the Maxwell equations, or the second equation uh, that we did earlier. This is easier because here you had a charge Q and here you have zero, so del dot B vector is zero. Now if we ever discovered magnetic monopoles, magnetic charge, then we would have to change this equation. This is a very elegant statement of the experimental observation that there are no magnetic monopoles. Those magnetic field lines close upon themselves and do not pierce through an enclosed surface area. Here is the third Maxwell equation which is Ampere's law plus the Maxwell piece and we use Stokes theorem. As Stokes theorem comes to the rescue to transform the left side into an area integral and that suggests that this right hand side should be in some kind of area integration and you say well yeah I have that here because the uh, flux, the electric flux here is E times A. If E is constant you have area perpendicular to it that you, there you have it. What about the current? Well you might recall from introductory physics that there's a such thing called the current density. It's a vector quantity but if you didn't remember, if you don't remember that, no problem because the mathematics is our guide. Often mathematics guides one's thinking toward a discovery. In other words, you are led to come up with some kind of new definition that multiplies an area, uh, just like you have a flux, which is an area here. So this J is current per area and it has a direction so that you really want the component that pierces through that uh, area. Think of a, a pipe for a wire where the charge is like water going through a pipe. Then you can think of the current density as the current per unit area and then dependent on the area of your cross section for your pipe when you multiply it out you get your current. So once when we do that we have the current and we have the flux. Notice that with the flux you want the electric field piercing the surface because that's the definition of flux perpendicular to the area. Very nice how these both will help us put all together and when we do that we'll have here mu naught 
times i and replace i with the area integration introducing the current density, vector density, and we'll replace the uh, flux, the one that multiplies the pair of constants here with its integral. And the next step will be to move the derivative inside since this is an integration over space and this is the derivative with respect to time. So you move that in, there's a partial derivative since there are other variables floating around here. And that brings us to the last step, which will very be very elegant to move everything to one side of the equation. So we can use the arbitrary argument once again, that since the area can be chosen in an arbitrary fashion, for this to always be zero, the integrand has to vanish, and that leads us to the third Maxwell equation in differential form. Very, very nice result. The fourth Maxwell equation is very easy to get because if this more complicated one here compared to this one down here, I just have the flux down here, I don't have the current term down here, so if that one went over to this differential form, all I have to do here is replace the uh, left side with del cross e vector and then the right side have my minus sign and uh, there are no constants. Well just the minus sign replaces these constants here and then the electric uh, flux here is replaced by the magnetic flux. So there you have it. These are the uh, four Maxwell equations in differential form. Here's the integral form and here's a differential form. The first one being the uh, law that we've called Gauss's law, which is another form of Coulomb's law. The second one here that there are no magnetic monopoles. The next one, this would be your Ampere's law, this first piece, and Maxwell's addition. And this one here, the fourth one, Faraday's law very elegant theoretical physics. The four Maxwell equations in integral form, the four Maxwell equations in differential form, and all because of those powerful theorems, the divergence theorem and Stokes theorem.